Good morning. Some of you are probably surprised to see me up here instead of Tim on a fill-in Sunday, but if you get a chance, stop by the sound booth, tell Tim happy birthday. It's his birthday today. Um, we're going to do a few announcements, and I'll pray, and then we'll get started here. Um, Pastor Mallory is on vacation till June 6th. Um, Memorial Day is tomorrow. I know a lot of us think it's just time for picnics and stuff like that, but Memorial Day is for our fallen comrades who never got to come home, never get to have a picnic with their family anymore. Um, Pastor Jim is doing three services tomorrow. Um, Bridgman at 9 a.m., Motley at 11 a.m., and Poplar at 1 p.m., but a lot of other communities are doing uh, services too. Please feel free to go join one of them. June 5th, we're having a funeral here for Tina Golf Olson. We're really short on help, really short on food and stuff. Please see Sherry. There's two inserts in your bulletins, the orange one and our newsletter. Take a look at those. June 9th is our first community picnic at Ernie Converse Park. Please come and join us. It's open to everybody from 5.30 to 7.30. Summer campers, we have scholarships available, so if you kids want to go to summer camp, please see Pastor Jim for, uh, about going, or Linda, about going to summer camp. Communion next Sunday. For those that are at home, you can get something ready. We'll have communion next Sunday, and I'm going to pray, and we'll get started. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day, and we thank you for Everybody that is here, and we pray for our pastors, Lord. We pray for Pastor Mallory and his family as they're traveling. We pray for Pastor Jim as you'll bless him in our service and with his Memorial Day services tomorrow. We pray for the remembrance of Memorial Day, Lord. We thank you so much for this glorious day and this place where we can come and worship. We do all this in your name, Lord. Amen. So we are going to start with the Battle Hymn of the Republic this morning. If you'll join us to stand and sing. Romans 8.37 says, We are more than conquerors through him who loved us.
the next song we're going to sing is King of My Heart. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, He is my song. Let the King of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, He is my song. You are good.
Thank you. You may be seated. And our little children that want to go to Children's Church, now's the time. We'll dismiss them to go to Children's Church. Before we pray, I want to say that uh, I'm very thankful to live in America. Amen? I'm very thankful to live in America. And as Craig has mentioned, this weekend is a time for us to remember those men and women that put on the uniform and didn't come home. And when you think that through half a million men, primarily men and some women, Civil War, quarter of a million men, some women, World War Two, I've forgotten the figure for World War I. Some of you know that better than I do. 40,000 plus at Korea, 58,000 plus at Vietnam. Men and women, the desert storm, Iraq, Afghanistan, a million lives didn't come home. That's what this weekend and tomorrow is about. And there are services in our area tomorrow. And I'm so thankful to men that are here today that are in the color guard. They will take the colors and they will take their military gun tributes and that they will be at every one of those services. I really have it pretty easy. I just have to pray. (laughs) But I am thankful for these men that are here this morning that have served and some of them are still serving and they will do so tomorrow to remember the dead. And so if you get a chance... Staples, Pillager, Motley, Poplar, yeah, thank you. Thank you to all of you that have served. If you get a chance, I would encourage you to go to one of those services tomorrow and be reminded of the sacrifice that was paid in American lives. That's what tomorrow is all about. Before we go any further, let's pray. Gracious and eternal God, we praise you, we love you, we are so thankful, so thankful for so many things, so thankful, oh God, for your great love, for your mercy, so thankful, oh God, that while we were yet sinners, the Bible said, and we know it to be true, Christ died for us, so thankful, Lord Jesus, to you for going to that cross. So thankful, Father, for your spirit. So thankful for your words. So thankful for your church. And we sit here this morning in the comforts of a comfortable building, so thankful to live in America. God, I pray for our nation. Our nation desperately needs you. We might not think we do. We might not realize we do, but we desperately need you. And on this Memorial Day weekend, Father, I want to say thank you again for men and women of the uniform over the last course of a century and a half, a million of them died. So we're reminded tomorrow on Memorial Day of the blood of Americans that was shed to keep the rest of us free. And we're reminded today on this day of the blood of your son to set us free from the bondage of sin. And so, Father, for all of it, we say thank you. Father, I want to pray this morning for our nation's salvation, for our community, for our state, for our families, for our co-workers. Father, I want to pray that we wouldn't just be caught up in religion or hanging our hat, so to speak, on our goodness, but rather be born of God, filled with the Holy Spirit of God, walking as that new creation, passionate to follow Jesus. I pray that for our nation today. And I do pray for families that have lost their loved ones this last week or two. 
Some are sitting amongst us this morning that have lost their siblings this week. Some are amongst us in our communities that have lost their dad or their sister or their brother in the last few days. Father, will you comfort them? Will you walk with those families that are grieving the loss of their loved one? Will you draw them close? Will you help them to see you? For those in hospitals, we've got a few. We pray this morning that you would comfort and encourage and strengthen their bodies. For those that are clinging to life, Father, we pray that they know and experience the peace of Jesus above all else, that they know Jesus and know his peace that when death comes, they're going home. And we pray for our students again. Most of them have graduated now. Some of our students still have a day or two left. Father, we pray for all of our students. We pray that you would guide all of them to you, O oh God. Oh, how we need you. Oh, how we need you in every dimension of our lives, O oh Lord. Guide us in this service and the next one that we will conduct here and the churches in our community and our, our region, in our state, in this nation. Guide us by your Spirit, O oh God. May it be about you. Not about me, not about any other pastor or priest, but about you, the living God, and Jesus Christ, your Son. Guide us by your Spirit in this service, I pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. In an outstanding article that I was reading online the other day from pastor and high school history teacher Peter Heck, the article was called The Unfolding Tragedy of Ex-Vangelicalism. How many of you have heard that word? Ex-Vangelicalism. You're like me up until about a month ago. I had not heard that word either. So anyway, I'm reading this article by pastor and high school history teacher Peter Heck, The Unfolding Tragedy of Ex-Vangelicalism. Peter wrote this, and I quote, <clears throat> Kevin Max, how many know that name? How about the DC Talk? How many know that name? Kevin Max, the Grammy Award-winning singer from the band DC Talk, has become the latest prominent Christian to announce his departure from evangelicalism. I think that you know what evangelicalism. We know that we are saved by the grace of God and our faith in the Son of God and what he has done on the cross and rose from the dead. That's evangelicalism. And according to Peter in this latest article... One more well-known Christian person has walked away from that. Peter continues, he said, For the uninitiated, that was me, and it sounds like if you didn't raise your hand when I ask you, it's also you. For the uninitiated, ex-vangelical is this new catchy term that those walking away from the doctrines of Protestant evangel um, evangelicalism use now to describe themselves, ex-evangelical. I hadn't heard that term until a month ago either when Charles mentioned it to me. I said, I never heard of it. Then I read this article and there it is again. Bear that in mind. Just hold that thought for a second. I'm going to read you some scripture. This scripture comes from 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. If you have been with us any amount of time this spring, you have heard me read this before. Let me read it to us again. This is the Apostle Paul to the church of Thessalonica talking about the second coming of the Lord and the rapture and so forth. Here's what he said. Now, brethren... Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gathering together to Him, 
we ask you not to be shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. In other words, he's saying, calm down a bit. Some of you have been told and thought that Jesus has returned again, and Paul is telling them, take a deep breath, relax, that has not happened. And then he says this, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day, that's the day of his return and his gathering together his people, that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. Some of you remembered when I read that a while ago when I was talking about the rapture and the second coming of the Lord Jesus, that falling away phenomenon Paul said, will happen, it is real. This article reminds me that's just more evidence of what Paul said would happen. I want to spend some time in Romans this summer, the Lord willing. I'm asking the Lord for direction for this summer's series. And so today, if you have your Bible, I am going to be in Romans chapter 12. I know that's not the logical place to start. You should start in chapter 1. But I will start in chapter 12 today and in verse 1. If you've got your Bibles, that's where we're at. Now, bear in mind these things that I have said, because I'm going to put it all together here in a minute. Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2. You got your Bibles? You, got, you ready? I beseech you therefore, brethren, Paul is talking to the church in Rome, and he's talking to believers, people that we would term today as evangelicals who have put their faith in Christ. Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And verse 2, he says this, And do not be conformed to this world. I'm going to read that again, in case we didn't get it. He says to the church, And do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. Now, you may have heard this, this catchy little phrase sometime along life's journey that says, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. Have you heard that? Yeah, you're a little better on that than you were on the last question I asked. <laughs> Paul is saying here to the Christians, when in Rome or any place else, don't do what the Romans do. Because the Romans are caught up in idolatry and sexual immorality and debauchery and drunkenness and everything else of the world. And that's why he says, do not be conformed to this world. That's why he said that. Remember that story I started with? The unfolding tragedy of ex-vangelicalism? Pop that up on the big screen, will you, for me, please, Kristen? This is a quote from that same article. Look at it with me. Former mega minister Rob Bell, most of you have heard some about these names. Former Desiring God author Paul Maxwell, former best-selling author Joshua Harris, former Hillsong worship musician Marty Sampson are just a few who recently walked the deconstructing path now embraced by Kevin Max of DC Talk. Now look at what Peter said in his article next. While alarming and disappointing, 
This phenomenon is anything but surprising. Either biblically, I just showed you biblically, it's not surprising, or culturally. Here's what Peter says. The pressure to conform to the patterns of the world have never been stronger than they are today. End quote. The pressure to conform to the patterns of this world have never been stronger than today. I've been pondering that since I read that a week or so ago. And let me elaborate just a moment. The pressure is not just on pastors or Christian musicians or Christian authors or church people, that same kind of pressure to conform is on our students. It is on our churches, our families, and our businesses. The pressure to conform to the image of the world is on us like never before. The pressure to look like the world, to act like the world, the pressure to talk like the world, the pressure to live like the world is all very real. You know it and I know it. The pressure to love like the world is very real in our lives today. Are you hearing me this morning, friends? This is what Paul is talking about when he said, I urge you, that word beseech, I urge you (coughs) by the mercies of God that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable God, which is your reasonable service. That's what we should do, be presenting ourselves, offering ourselves to the living God. And then he says, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. Some of you will remember last week we looked at Judges really, really briefly. And we looked at the phrase that was in Judges a couple of times. It says, there was no king in Israel at that time, and they did what was right in their own eyes. Doing what is right in our own eyes equals conforming to the world. Are you hearing me this morning, friends? Doing what's right in our own eyes equals being conformed to this world. There's pressure on people to conform to the image of the world. I've said it to you many, many, many times over the last few years. Friends, if we do not understand the Word of God, if we are not intentionally in the Word of God, if we're not letting the Word of God mold us in the image of God, the world will mold you in its image. It's going to. We want to be liked. We want to fit in. We want to look like, talk like, and act like everybody else. When Pastor Peter wrote this article, and I read that phrase, the pressure to conform to the pattern of the world have never been stronger than today, I thought, man, oh man, is that dead on? He's dead on. You see, friends, he's not talking about, he's not talking to the world about living like the world. The world's already doing their own thing. He's talking to Christians and saying, don't be conformed to that image. When he says, brethren, here early on, he's talking to the church. Pastors, And churches are under pressure to be popular. You know what I'm talking about. 
to appease everyone. To grow the numbers. And sometimes this is at the expense of the gospel of Jesus. Many pastors and churches are pressured to accept and love regardless of sin. Now let me clarify just a moment. You've heard me say a hundred times, we are to love our neighbors as ourselves. Part of loving our neighbors is pointing them to the cross and to Christ. Part of loving our family, our neighbors, even those in the church, is suggesting humbly and graciously doing what's right in our own eyes is not His will. Our students are under pressure to have the perfect look. To have the perfect grades. To pick the best schools and the best, most lucrative occupations. And if that's not enough, which is plenty of pressure for our students... If that's not enough, they're under tremendous worldly pressure to be involved sexually. When the Bible says there is a time and a place for sexual intimacy, it is in the boundaries of marriage with one man and one woman. And yet our students are pressured continually There are entire organizations, I don't have to name them, you know, that are pouring money to get students to be sexually active so that they might need an abortion. That's happening amongst us. And if that isn't enough for our students, the pressure to conform to the world's thought today in the whole arena of sexuality, telling our students, even if they were born male and want to transition to female, then just do it. The pressures are real. And they're happening to our students. Families are under pressure to look like the world to do the things the world does, to talk the way the world talks, to act the way the world talks. And all the while, the Apostle Paul is charging the church of Jesus Christ, do not be conformed to the image of the world. Are you hearing me this morning, brothers and sisters? That's what the Apostle Paul said from the Word of God, do not be conformed to the image of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. How do we combat that pressure? How do our students put up with that pressure? Paul said, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It starts up here, by the renewing of your mind. You say, Jim, what's that supposed to mean? How am I supposed to do that? I'm going to tell you what I told some folks in the last few days, one-on-one, and we had some great conversation. Great conversation with some, with some people lately in my office, couples, singles. I'm going to tell you what I told them. When to answer this question, what are we supposed to do about that? What, are, what is renewing my mind even supposed to mean? Are you listening? Are you ready? If your walk and my walk with Jesus is not intentional, you will have no strength not to conform to the image of the world. Let me elaborate just a little bit. 
If my walk with Jesus does not intentionally include this, his word, every day, if I haven't got the time for this every day, who am I kidding that I can combat the ways of the devil and the world? If my walk with Jesus isn't intentional enough to spend time alone with God every day, you think I'm going to be able to combat the ways of the world? It ain't going to happen. If my walk with Jesus isn't intentional enough to come together and worship in the corporate setting, oh, if I have time, Jim, oh, I'm busy, Jim, that's conforming to the image of the world. If my walk with Jesus isn't intentional and in his word and in prayer and worship often and being around God's people often, if these spiritual disciplines are not intentional, you will never have the ability to resist being conformed to the image of the world. Never. You can't do it on your own and neither can I. That's why Paul told the church, when you heard the old saying, when in Rome, do as the Romans do, that's why Paul said to the church, don't you dare do what the Romans do when you're in Rome. You are a Christian. That's why he said it. And yet... There's this pressure from the world to look like the world. Christian musicians, Christian authors, pastors, people in the church house, our students. There's this worldly pressure, like the pressure cooker cooking the jars of stuff inside, pressure, pressure, pressure. How am I going to combat that? Paul said, by the renewing of your mind, by getting intentional with the Word, by getting intentional with your walk. That's how. <clears throat> I love this quote from the Bible knowledge commentary that I was reading on this very matter this week. It says this about not being conformed. It says this, and I quote, Living according to the lifestyle of this present evil age must now be put aside. It's that simple. Are you hearing me? This is what Paul is saying. And in Peter's article, it said, and, and it, it was clear. It is clear on these musicians. Oh, be popular. Be cool, pastors. Look like the world. Do this, do that. The pressure is real. And Peter said it right when he said, the pressure to conform to the image of the world has never been greater. And the Apostle Paul comes along and says, Do not be conformed to the image of the world. This, this whole idea of transform, transformed, that Greek word is metamorphoste, which obviously we know to mean metamorphosis. It means a total change from inside out. And the key to this change, and I'm quoting again from the knowledge, Bible knowledge commentary, as one's mind keeps on being made new by the spiritual input of God's word, prayer, and Christian fellowship, his lifestyle keeps on being transformed. There's no other way. We have got to be in his word. We have got to be with his people. We have got to be in prayer with the living God. There's no other way to transform our mind. 
And if we don't take the time for that, guess what? We're going to be ex-evangelicals. Because the world is going to squeeze into that mold. That's what's going to happen. You say, Jim, you're saying that Joshua Harris and those, Marty Sampson, those weren't reading the word? I don't know. I'm saying what Paul is saying. The Apostle Paul says, do not be conformed to the image of the world. And the way to do that, you're going to have to work on your mind. You're going to have to fill it with the things of God over and over and over. That's what he's talking about. Let me ask this, friends. I'm going to wrap it up here in a minute, a couple minutes, maybe. Maybe even three or four. I could. Let me start with this. Do you really know Jesus? That question has to be asked. Paul, Jesus, and, and lowly old wretched Mike Jim is not asking, do you know about God? Or have you been to church? Or have you some church membership? Have you been born of God? Have you genuinely repented of sin, surrendered everything to Christ, laid it all down and said, not my will anymore, but thy will be done, O God. Have you surrendered it all to Jesus? That's what I'm asking. Because being good is not going to be good enough on that day. I assure you, when the Bible says, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God, and the wages of sin is death, that's what it means. Have you been born of God? You're not sure even how to do that? Then call me. Come see me. Send me a text. Send me an email. Send me something. We must be born again, Jesus said, or you will never see the kingdom of heaven. And to those of us that said, yes, Jim... I have given my life to Christ. I've repented of my sin. I've claimed Jesus as Lord. I want to follow Jesus. Then my question is, knowing what I just read to you, uh, you, just saw the, you just saw the quote from Pastor Peter Hick. <clears throat> my question for you as it is for me, what are we doing to be transformed by the renewing of our minds? Because if we're not doing something, we too will succumb to that crowd, that ever-widening movement of ex-evangelicals. What are you doing to be in the process of transforming your mind? You must ask yourselves of that, because Paul said that's the only way you're going to not be conformed to the image of the world. Let me say this. If we're just coasting along in life, taking our chances, thinking, oh, I'm a pretty good person. I get to church once in a while. I even read the Bible once in a while. If we're just coasting along in life, not being intentional about our walk with Jesus, we will find ourselves in the same boat as the folks that I've mentioned earlier from this article. We must be intentional about our walk with Jesus. It's that important. Last Sunday night, this is, this is you'd think this doesn't fit, but it does. Last Sunday night, I was speaking to the uh, students some of the Staples Motley High School seniors at baccalaureate, and I, and I, Charles had put me onto this little quote, and so I found the article, I read the article, and so I challenged them that way. I want to mention to you because it all fits right here with what I'm saying. In the Christian Post a couple of weeks ago, there was this article, the headline was this, 
43% of millennials don't know, don't care, do not believe that God exists. That's the title of the article. 43%. I'm not picking on millennials. I love millennials. But this is what the article says. 43% of millennials don't know, don't care, do not believe that God exists. So in my preparation to speak to the seniors last week, I know they're not millennials. They're the, they're the group right below them. They're Generation Z. Uh, I said to them, in my preparation to share that with you, I called up my cell phone and said, hey, okay, Google, how many millennials are there? You ever do that? You ask Google a few things? I know kids do, so I figured I may as well try it too. <laughs> Told me there's 70 some million millennials in America. 43% of 70, 70 some million is 30 plus million in one age group that are, that are now saying, <clears throat> don't know, don't care, and don't believe. That's 30 some million of one age group. You say, Jim, what's that supposed to do with anything? That's what happens. That's what happens when we are not intentional about our walk with Jesus. That's what happens when we parents, grandpas and grandmas, church people are not intentional about telling our children in the next generation the importance of walking with Jesus. That's what happens when the world pressure, pressure, pressure on our young people to conform to the image and the ways of the world, and they don't understand how to conform to the image and the ways of God. That's what happens. So I'm going to close with this. Number one, you need to know Jesus. Not say to me, Jim, I believe in God. That's a wonderful start. You need to be born again. You need to know Jesus. But to all those that have professed faith in Christ, I'll ask you once more, challenge you once more before I Sit down and we sing. What are you going to do to not fall into the conforming of this world? Because the pressures are real. doesn't matter your age. I didn't happen to poll the older folks in our congregation. Some of them are even older than I am. But it doesn't matter the age. The pressure to conform to the image of the world is real. And Paul said, do not be conformed to the image of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. That's only going to happen if you're intentional about it. Jane, Jess, let's get ready to sing. That's only going to happen if you're intentional in your walk with Jesus. Amen? Let's stand together and sing this closing song.
I've asked Pastor Chuck to dismiss us in prayer. Brother? Father, Lord, we thank you that you have spoken to us once again. And now, Lord, we recognize that the challenge now lies to each one of us. How will we respond to your word, to your truth, to your love? Oh, God, may we determine that we will never be the same. But we will let you speak to us and through us so that we will not fall to the temptation of being conformed to the world, but being transformed. Oh, God, have mercy. And now, Lord, we pray that you would give us courage, wisdom, and that we may walk in your power, and that we will know you as King of kings and Lord of lords. And may we go forth victorious, and may you be honored, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.